So let's move it on over to, to uh, Molly. There you go. Hey. There she is. How's it going, Molly? Astro World. <laughs> Again, good. yes, good. absolutely. What's going on? How you been? Been doing pretty good. Um, finally in the data analysis phase of my of my PhD research, so now I yeah. just get to do all coding all the time, which I'm very excited about. So <laughs> no more nice. classes, no more exams. That just is, <laughs> that's great. You know, it, you know, it's that it's awesome. still not relaxing, but it's still a lot relaxing than classes and tests. So. <laughs> yeah, a little, a little stress is ramped down a little bit for now. <laughs> that's that's awesome. Uh, yeah, when we everyone's asking when you're when you when are you building your shed? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, well. So uh, I now co-own about nine acres of land out in uh, Arizona, about an hour and a half east of Tucson. Uh, and the uh, my, my buddy and I were gonna uh, build that observatory probably in about six or seven years. So it's coming up. <laughs> awesome. That's, that's, gonna that's, gonna awesome. Great. that's gonna be awesome. So uh, Molly, you got a little presentation for us regarding your your. You're multitasking, I guess you could say. <laughs> yes, yeah. But uh, um, you, you want to head to it? You, you can just share a screen and go right ahead. There we go. Okay. Also, real quick, are you hearing my 3D printer at all? Because I can go pause it. Um, no, I think that's just no, my gain. Yeah, that's just right, my gain noise. You're, you're good. Cool. Just making sure. <laughs> yep. well, yeah, I got a should, should we ask Christmas what you're printing? Time. or? <laughs> I'm printing a little Appa figurine for... <laughs> Appa, Appa, oh yeah, yeah. Appa from uh, Avatar. The last from Avatar, 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 the big, the big yeah. arrowhead. There you go. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's printing now, and I'm gonna print some some stuff for friends and family as my first projects, and um, yeah, got some astro projects I'll probably work on too at some point soon. I, I I love the last Airbender, although I didn't like the movie so much, but we'll talk about that some other time. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. You're on, all Ma. right. Cool. Um, yeah, so I, I image with four rigs most nights that it's clear. Sometimes uh, one or two are either down for maintenance or uh, I don't feel like, I just don't feel like opening them up that night. <laughs> but I have the capability to image with four rigs simultaneously from my backyard. So I want to talk about how I do that and how the heck I got there because <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's, it's quite a thing to, to do slide will advance here. Yeah, so um, my astrophotography started back in 2015 when I got my first telescope as a gift from, uh, from a friend. And uh, here I am out at the local state park with this 8-inch Celestron on a, uh, a schmidt Cassegrain on an Altaz mount, uh, looking at Saturn for the first time and being just about bowled over by it, like I think most of us <laughs> have experienced. And I figured out that I could attach my camera to it and basically convert it into a giant camera lens and take some pictures. So here's a, a single one minute subframe on that setup with my, uh, my D3100 DSLR. And I was able to see some color on the Lagoon Nebula and like way more nebulosity that I can see with my eye. And I was kind of hooked from there. Um, I mean, I've been keeping a log since day one, so the number here is is the night number that I that I've been out. Um, so you'll see that go up as as time goes on here. Uh, so after messing around with that rig for about six months, uh, trying to figure out how to image with it, my uncle who had who had previously done astrophotography and was looking at getting back into it, upgraded his rig and sent me his old rig, which was a Celestron CGE mount with a uh, C11 riding on top of it. So that was uh, an incredible gift. And I was able to, now that I had an equatorial mount, really start to do astrophotography a little more seriously in February 2016. Um, I still got my DSLR on here and running everything with my tablet out at the local state park. And I was able to get some reasonable images with it, images that I was excited enough about to, uh, to really kind of keep me hooked and just think that it was uh, incredible and I wanted to keep going. Uh, actual quote from my log here. <laughs> just totally blown away at how much detail and color I was able to see taking, you know, 28, 30 second images here. I, I wasn't guiding yet, so I was limited to about 30 second images, but got an image you could see, which was really incredible. 
Well, that lasted <laughs> less than a year. Um, I started having some uh, cable cabling troubles with that mount. It uses these Ethernet cables and uses the shielding on them as a ground pin, and they just weren't working very well. I did a mod kit upgrade, and something happened during that, and I fried one of the motors or the encoder on the motor or something like that, and spent months and months trying to figure out how to, how to fix this darn thing. So in the meantime, while I was working on that, I started using, I, I joined the astronomy club earlier in 2016 and started using one of the uh, telescopes on their facility, which uh, is this 140 millimeter Vixen refractor here and uh, plug in my DSLR into that and not having to haul all my equipment out to the observatory anymore. And just being able to take my camera and my and my computer out there, hook up and start imaging. So that was really, really nice to be able to start doing. It's on a Lasmandy uh, G11, which had some quirks, but it, it did pretty pretty well most of the time. And I was able to get what I consider my first good astrophoto in February 2017 on night number 76 <laughs> uh, with my with a new an upgraded DSLR, one that I could control with my computer better, and got this nice image of the Rosette Nebula um, with some five minute exposures because I was able to to do auto guiding on um, on that setup. And I won second place in the Astronomical League's Imaging Deep Sky competition that year. So uh, that was very thrilling. And um, yeah, I was definitely, definitely in head over heels by this point, being able to take these images that were absolutely mind blowing. So uh, I, en I enlisted the help of, of uh, uh, Clay Sherrod, who works on mounts and um, uh, tries to get them to work better or to work at all. And he was unable to help me fix my CGE in the end, but he had a CGE Pro that he'd recently acquired that he sold me at a discount. And so I upgraded to the CGE Pro, used the C11, I have a, I got, got a guide scope on there, and was using that happily over the rest of the summer. And was able to get some nice pictures with that. Now I could take longer exposures. Um, I think this was actually at, yeah, this was at the 2017 Texas Star Party that I got this one. Uh, after having seen this in the 36-inch Dobsonian at Texas Star Party and seeing almost as much detail as you get in this picture <laughs> with that telescope, it was really something. But, you know, after a while, hauling the big rig in, out to the state park, I was hauling 200-plus pounds of equipment up and down the stairs in my second-story apartment, and I thought about kind of downsizing a little bit and starting in a place where people should start astrophotography, <laughs> which is a lightweight mount, this is the Slush John AVX, and a lightweight refractor. And uh, this is a, um, a Borg refractor that a member of the Astronomy Club passed on to me. And uh, still using my DSLR here, although I think I had recently bought uh, my first Astro camera around that time. Um, yeah, later that summer I was using, kind of got the my new ZWO ASI 1600 monochrome worked out and uh, was and got guiding worked out on this mount and was able to start getting some nice monochrome images with it and got another nice picture of the Whirlpool Galaxy, a little sharper, a little more color. Uh, we have that set up, night number 148 in mid-2018. Well, the CGE Pro started having some problems as well. And so here I am trying to fix these weird motor issues that were happening and trying to get that all worked out and eventually giving up on that. And I'll, I'll return to it a little bit, but I haven't returned to it lately. I think it is fixable. Um, but in this time, uh, in, in, in um, early, sorry, in about August 2019, I moved out to California and uh, started getting, I had a backyard for the first time instead of my apartment, now I had a backyard where I could set up on a somewhat more permanent basis instead of having to go out, take all my gear out to the observatory. So here I've got the AVX set up. And earlier that summer at the 2019 Texas Star Party, um, same uncle sold me his Takahashi when he upgraded to the newer Takahashi uh, FSQ-106N. And I never, I did not think I was going to own one of these for uh, until much further in my astronomy career. but here I am three years in, or uh, four, yeah, four years in, uh, owning a Takahashi, which was absolutely mind-blowing. So I was able to get that set up in the backyard. 
And I would take my tablet out there and let the tablet run it and was able to get some some nice shots even from my uh from my backyard um this one might have been out from actually from a dark sky site that i would take this stuff to uh oh no this was from the backyard yeah because it covers november to january yeah that's right yeah from my boil seven backyard outside san francisco still able to get a nice picture of the pleiades and by this point i had started um using the tablet to run my rig all night. I was using Sequence Generator Pro, and I had a, um, uh, let's see, did I have a focuser for it yet? I must have had a focuser for it yet. And um, be able to do mer Meridian flips and run multiple targets in a night. And yeah, I definitely had the focuser because the Takahashi is very temperature sensitive. It needs to be refocused about every half a degree to degree temperature change. Uh, but, you know, the Celestron AVX mount leaves, uh, leaves some room, leaves uh, some things to be desired. So I finally just like, you know what, I'm just going to get a mount that just works instead of messing around with these other mounts. And I finally just got myself a Paramount, uh, Paramount MIT at the 2019 Advanced Imaging Conference and was totally thrilled to be able to make that purchase and finally have a mount that really just worked. And uh, software basically they say in their advertisements in Sky and Telescope that it removes the mount from the equation in terms of like difficulty of using the mount. And that is an absolutely correct statement. <laughs> the mount is, is just a thing that works all the time now. So I grease it every year or two and it just keeps working. So I when I, you know, I, I, so I got the Paramount, but the AVX was still working. I couldn't just put a perfectly good mount away in the garage. So I'm like, well, I got two telescopes, so I'm going to set it back up. <laughs> so I put the Takahashi on the Paramount and put my the the 8 inch onto the AVX and trying to figure out what I could do with that setup in uh, November of 2019. And the 8 inch on the AVX didn't work so great. The guiding wasn't quite good enough to uh, to be able to get reliable long exposures. So I started just messing around with stuff at this point. I was like, well, I know you can put one of these cameras, one of these astro cameras on a camera lens. So let me figure that out. So uh, here's my first attempt at using a, a Nikon 70 to 300 millimeter zoom lens with my ZWBO 1600 and a filter wheel. Um, actually, no, that's the two. Yeah, I, I'd just gotten the ZWO 294 color camera. The filter wheel has, um, I could switch between uh, light pollute like regular light pollution filter and um uh let's see yeah i think by this point i'd gotten the uh dual narrowband filter the optolong l extreme uh ignore the counterweights in this picture i put the camera on and not adjusted the counterweights yet <laughs> you don't need that much counterweight for that camera lens uh and then um after kind of messing around with that stuff i ended up moving the eight inch over onto the paramount because I could take advantage of the Paramount's better tracking with the longer focal length of the 8-inch. So I got myself a focuser for the 8-inch and an off-axis guider and got that whole thing set up. So then I was imaging all night with the 8-inch on the Paramount, and I was guiding and able to adjust focus per filter and was really taken off with being able to do tons of astrophotography, especially out in the Bay Area and in, in, around Berkeley where I was at. Um, it's pretty clear a lot of nights. So I was able just to image all the time. And uh, so later in, in 2020, um, I, I decided to go ahead and revisit the CGE Pro to see what I could do to maybe fix it. And, and it, it was kind of working actually when I pulled it back out of the box. So I set up a third rig, which was putting this Vixen Newtonian that had been given to me by a club member here in Ohio. And uh, started, I started doing some scientific imaging with it with the American Association of Variable Star Observers. So now I was running three rigs <laughs> all night, um, but I was having USB problems running it on one computer. So I started bringing out um, a laptop and a tablet and using two computers, one to run two of them and one to run the other one. And from my backyard, I got some narrowband filters that year and uh, was able to do even better imaging from my pretty light polluted backyard by doing narrowband imaging. So I got a hydrogen alpha and an O3 filter, and over the course of some months, acquired 
eight, almost 18 hours of narrowband data and got a really deep image of the Dumbbell Nebula that I was, I, and still am extremely proud of. Having the computers outside, I used to run in and out of the house, but then I'd heard, heard from somebody or somewhere about using an app called TeamViewer to remote into a computer outside. So I started getting that set up and was able to sit inside at my desk and control my computers without having to run in and out of the house and check on things. And this also let me start to live stream things that I was looking at on the telescope. So um, I this is with like, let's see, I think I was doing this with the universe today sometimes and also with Global Star Party um, for Explore Alliance. And here's a shot of Mars from my eight inch out in the backyard where that was live streaming or about ready to live stream here. Then I took all this on the road. About four hours away from where I was at, there was uh, a, an astronomy club outside Sacramento, had a, a really nice dark sky site up in the Tahoe National Forest. I had bought a trailer in 2021, or sorry, in, in 2020. Yeah, I drove, drove home, visit my parents, bought a trailer. And then I could camp with all of my astronomy gear and set it all up, enjoy the night sky for a while, and then go to bed. So, uh, and I'd also, I bought a new mount that year. I got an Ioptron SEM40 because the AVX was still getting kind of annoying to use. But then I also brought out my, I had a Skywalker Star Adventure I'd bought some, a uh, couple years prior that I was experimenting putting camera lenses on and, and, uh, and guiding with that. You can see my lovely water bottle counterweight <laughs> attached to the, the Star Adventure over there on the right. So yeah, imaging with three rigs all night out at a dark sky site. And um, I, I didn't have a way to connect to it remotely out there. Uh, I, I could go over um, cell phone to, well, no, I didn't have a Wi-Fi router out there yet. I was still running out in and out of the trailer to go check on things. But yeah, I was able to camp out there with my stuff, which is great. And under really dark skies, and I was able to get some really nice images out of the Takahashi. Then I moved back to Ohio for school and I had a, an even bigger backyard with a nice cement pad. So I got two of my telescope rigs set back up, running on my laptop, and that turned into three when I set the science rig back up. And then that turned into four <laughs> when I was like, yeah, you know, I, I should try putting this, the star adventure out there. And and uh, I got a Rokinon 135 millimeter camera lens and, um, uh, I was I was I had a a camera that I was testing for QHY, so I had an extra camera. So now I've got four rigs set up out in the backyard. So this is my current state, having these all these rigs out here in the back. And yeah, I've been able to get some killer images uh, with Hubble palette imaging, being able to just image for a couple months at a time on the same targets. I turn on the tel I take the covers off, turn turn everything on, hit go and go to bed and then download the data in the morning. It's really quite remarkable. <laughs> um, sorry, my cat's coming up into my business. Please, thank you. <laughs> so my current loadout for people who are interested in what all exact mechanics I've got running in the backyard here. Uh, primary rig has a um, nine and a quarter inch Edge HD, the 2600 ZWO color camera running on the Paramount and all of the focuser and the filters and everything else is listed here. And I'm running the, uh, the, the primary rig, which is the Paramount and the Edge HD, and the secondary rig, which is the Ioptron and the Takahashi, on a Nook, so a little uh, headless um, remote access computer that I remote into from inside my house. And now I've actually got a Wi-Fi router set up out there as well so that I can um, uh, take that whole setup with me when I go out to places like the Okie Tech Star Party that uh, don't have uh, reliable, like me going up through Chrome Remote Desktop and back down to the computer. Instead, I can just remote in directly using Windows Remote Desktop and an Ethernet cable. So now I've got that all set up in the backyard, and then the science rig is run on my laptop. Um, the secondary rig with the Takahashi. That's on a uh, Ioptron Sem40. Currently, I have a Q the QHY 533 on the back of there that I'm testing for them. But uh, 
before that I was running my 1600 monochrome on there, which is currently sitting in the house as I test the other camera. Uh, Optolong filters I'm testing for them, and yeah, guide scope, filter wheel, ZWO focuser. The science rig, I am running on the AVX. It doesn't track great because it's a little heavy for it, and uh, but the focal length's not too long, and I only need about 60 second exposures to do the uh, variable star imaging. So I've got an old QSI 583 on there that was donated to me, and um, uh, Johnson Cousins BVRI filters, which were also donated to me. <laughs> a lot of, lot of, lot of help from a lot of people over these last several years, and run that on a lap. I'm on a 2012 laptop, old Lenovo that just won't die, and I put a solid state hard drive in it, and it behaves like a modern new computer. So working pretty nicely. And finally, the Star Adventurer, which I've got a Rokinon 135 millimeter f/2 lens. I got this 3D printed um, rig for it on a Gina Astro that has a little box to put a ZWO focuser. It's got a slot on the side to attach a ZWO ASI Air. I run this on my computer for now because I haven't taken the time to learn how to use the Air. Um, but I uh, got my color camera on there and a filter drawer. And I do have to go point this one manually. I will eventually buy a lightweight probably um, a strain wave mount, one of those little tiny ones for this rig, uh, so that I don't have to go out there and point it by hand every night when it's cold, which I haven't done recently <laughs> because I don't feel like it. <laughs> uh, eventually I'll get a, a go-to mount to replace that one. Um, but this is a fun little rig to play with as well, and definitely this one's really great at star parties. Super easy to, to use. In fact, I would almost recommend some people start there because you don't have to deal with go-to and other stuff like that. Uh, yeah, so um, if you are interested in doing some of this, like either running like running multiple telescopes or even just running remotely on one telescope, I'm going to walk through how you can get started doing that and kind of the logical steps to take to build up that procedure one at a time instead of trying to bite off the whole thing all at once. So uh, this is a picture of me at the Okie Tech Star Party running four rigs which people kept coming over to look at because it's kind of ridiculous. And it was, but it was so much fun. <laughs> so some tools for success in doing multi-rig imaging and really doing um, good astrophotography to start with is having a good tracking mount. It is more important to have a mount that works well than to have a good telescope. Invest in your mount before you invest in your telescope. Because you can, even with a, with a not so good telescope, you can still get reasonable images out of it if your tracking is good. But if your tracking is not good, you're not able to get reliable go-tos, your stars are streaking, then you have no images. And that's a bummer. So start with a good mount, even if you have to get a cheap telescope for it, and then invest in the telescope later. And, and uh, you can work with, an, with a cheaper camera to start with as well. Uh, once you get through that, uh, having an electronic focuser is uh, almost, it's, it's pretty much essential for doing all night uh, hands-off imaging. For, for refractors, they tend to be pretty sensitive to temperature change. So um, having a, being able to refocus during the night as the temperature changes is really important. For Schmidt-Cassegrain's, grains, they tend to have mirror flop. Even the Edge HD with the locking mirror, it still shifts a little bit, and it does shift a little bit with temperature. Um, with the Newtonian, you have to deal with flexure as the camera's kind of hanging off there at a weird angle for gravity. And for all, no two filters are really truly parfocal, and especially when you're on a, a system with a really tight focus point like a refractor, being able to change focus points filter to filter uh, lets you image with multiple filters in the same night which is uh, really good for doing multiple targets. Um, if you are using a monochrome camera, an electronic filter wheel is a must to be able to change those filters during the night for different targets and on the same target. If you're using a color camera, you don't need a filter wheel, but it can be handy to be able to switch back and forth between having a light pollution filter and a multi-narrowband filter. Like I'll image with the wideband filter before the moon up and then switch to narrowband after the moon comes up, or I'll do like a reflection nebula for half the night and then an emission nebula for half the night where it's better to have wide band for the reflection and narrow band for the emission. So it's nice to have a filter wheel for even for the color camera. 
Um, a dedicated computer is really nice to be able just to leave out there and not have to take in and out of the house. It doesn't have to be good. These The software that you use to run the mounts and the guiding and even running the SkyX with the Paramount does not require a lot of computing power. So that Intel Nook that I have has a 7th gen i3 mobile chip in it and like 8 gigs of RAM. Um, no graphics, just the integrated graphics and like a um, an NVMe drive. You don't need a lot of specs on those. It's a $400 Nook. And um, having a Wi-Fi antenna is really helpful for getting your Wi-Fi out into your backyard. Or you can use a long Ethernet cable and slash or I use an outside access point to help get my internet out there. Um, a telescope cover is important to not have to bring your stuff in and out of the house every night. So I have a Telegizmo 365. I have one for each telescope. And they really are as good as they say. My telescopes are always dry. And it mostly keeps the sun off. Um, the Paramount is starting to fade a little bit in color, as you can see in this picture. But um, mostly keeps the sun off. And yeah, keeps everything dry. And I've had my telescopes outside for about two years now, straight. And they're doing OK. And uh, practice, practice, practice. I am going on, I'm over 700 nights of imaging now since mid-2015. And uh, it, it, that's how I've been able to do all of this, is just iterating night after night after night, working out all the bugs. There's a lot of nights where I didn't get hardly any images because something or another broke, but eventually figured out all of those bugs. And moonlit nights or nights with poor transparency are really good nights to test stuff, like sit out there, and get a target lined up to, to practice doing a meridian flip to make sure the meridian flip is going to go smoothly. Or um, try auto guiding for the first time or running an autofocus routine, getting the stuff figured out for that. Uh, so those are good nights to be working out the bugs and not be missing primo nights that are darker. Um, so I, in order to, to really kind of take this apart into chunks of getting from not having done any astrophotography to running automated throughout the night, here's my kind of recommended path. And some of these might make a little more sense in some other places, but it's kind of one way to do it. It's first to get familiar with your mount, do some visual observing with it, uh, and just control your camera manually. This is when DSLRs are really handy. And just like learn how it functions, understand how it moves in right ascension and declination, and how it goes to a target how reliably it goes to a target, how to do the alignment procedure, stuff like that. Get familiar with your camera. If it's a DSLR, highly recommend just going out and shooting in the daytime, understand what ISO is, understand what exposure time does, and uh, what f-stop does, and, uh, and do this at night as well on a tripod. Um, try different settings and, and see like, oh, it gets way too noisy at 6400, but it's more manageable at 3200 ISO and just understand the operation of the camera. And then if you have an astro camera, you can practice in the daytime with sharp cap or on the moon or on, a, on planets with sharp cap or um, other of those sort of um, lightweight watch, uh, like video mode pieces of software to kind of get familiar with just the operation of that camera. Then run the mount and the camera together start adding auto guiding, which uh, if you haven't done it before, can take some practice and understanding and lots of reading forums to figure out. But it will allow you to take longer than 30 second exposures, which is about what you're usually limited to on most mounts without auto guiding. Uh, put a filter wheel in the mix, if, uh, especially if you've got a monochrome camera or even with a color camera, it's nice to have, as I said before. Add a focuser. And somewhere in this mix, start poking around with sequencing software because um, you can run multiple targets and it will do all of the things like running autofocus, changing filters, slowing the different targets. The sequencing software will do all of that for you, but you can kind of do one thing at a time. Like you can start doing sequencing software with just the camera and the mount or even just the camera and then just point them out yourself. Um, and then as you add, different hardware on adding those in to your sequence. Uh, once you kind of get the sequencing figured out, trust it to do a meridian flip. Watch it happen the first couple of times. Make sure you've got the mount settings 
right so that um, the meridian flip happens that uh, like you don't uh, like I have, a, I have hard stops on mine so that it doesn't um, start tracking too far past the meridian. I have the sequencing software set up to do a meridian flip no more than five five uh, minutes past, so I don't like to go too far um, up in the air. And yeah, it, this is a big step for a lot of people, trusting the software to do a meridian flip, but you're going to have to if you want to let it image during the night. Setting up remote access on your computer means that you can sit inside where it's warm or cool and work from in there, and it makes it a little more comfortable and you can be a little more patient. Start adding multiple targets. And then finally, sleep during your imaging sequence. <laughs> so, yeah, a lot, lot of steps. Sleep. Um, and, and yeah, and you know, some sleep. of these, like, <laughs> yeah, um, it, it, it's so nice, I'm telling you, to get finally get sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the first time that you could actually sit there and like be nice and comfortable and then just let your imaging run that first night where you see you're like, why didn't I do this a long time ago? Right, Ma? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's nice to be able to sit inside instead of being freezing outside, which I spent many, many nights doing back in ye olden days. But uh, now I can be at the bar and check in on my telescopes from my phone using Chrome Remote Desktop. <laughs> which is great. <laughs> I can even troubleshoot them from the bar. <laughs> I have Wi-Fi outlets on my mounts so that if I need to power cycle the mount, I can cue it uh, from wherever I'm at with my phone. <laughs> That's awesome. It's great. Uh, power management is a really important step as well. It's really easy to get out of control with cables. And uh, especially if you're going to be outside, you need to have something that is going to stay dry. So I got this large outdoor power enclosure box on Amazon and it's rainproof. It's mostly bug proof. Occasionally I get a spider that figured out how the heck to get in there, but it's, it's a uh, pretty clean in there. Even after months of being outside, I got a surge protector power strip and uh, it's also got some USB ports on it, which I use for USB dew heaters. I might eventually consider a UPS uh, primarily for being at star parties, where power can get interrupted sometimes, but those are expensive and heavy, so let's I'll decide that later. Uh, all the power bricks, the AC-DC converters, those all go inside so that um, water can't get into any of the connections between like the, um, the, the things that connect into the power brick. Um, I have, like I mentioned, I have the Wi-Fi enabled outlet switches. Zigbee tends to be a little more reliable than straight up Wi-Fi. Zigbee is like Philips Hue. Um, but uh, you can't use those when you're in the field. Whereas the Wi-Fi ones, I can set up a local Wi-Fi network and control those um, I, in theory from my phone. I haven't actually tested that. Um, and eventually I'm gonna get an ethernet enabled power strip so that I can turn on and off every device individually. Um, but I'm gonna start doing that as I start looking toward getting my, uh, pre preparing for building an observatory because I can do like I'm slowly building in that direction. Like I'm gonna start adding things that I'm going to have in the observatory so I can practice with them while they're here in the backyard. And uh, so that by the time we actually build the observatory, I've got a lot of the bugs worked out on how to do truly remote operations while still being able to run outside and fix things. And uh, I have a, on one of my telescopes now, I have a power box, um, the Pegasus power box, which runs all the power and the USB from up on top of the scope which can kind of help control uh, cabling and things like that. And speaking of cabling, some of this cable, the self-closing cable sheath, that uh, because of its sort of stiffness and um, like, and, and uh, instead of just having cables hanging down and free, it kind of keeps them all bundled together. This prevents it from, from snagging on the mount. I don't think I've ever had my cable sheath get caught on the mount once I sort of got its position sorted out and got it hung from strategic places on the mount. I use Velcro for where the cables pop out to keep the, the uh, self-closing cable sheath from kind of opening back up and letting the cables out from them being pulled on. Um, and the really nice thing is that when I get, to get ready to go to the star party, I simply unplug everything from the top of the scope, coil up the cable sheath, set it on top of the power box and then put the whole thing into a like a fabric grocery bag and then that's it 
all my power and USB and everything is in one container. And then I get out to the field and I just plop the box down, run the cables back up, plug everything back in, and I've recabled and rewired my whole mount in five minutes. So highly recommend doing that, especially if you have a more mobile setup. Um, yeah, you can see I've got a highlight on the image here where that cable sheath goes, and I've got a smaller one that goes from the power box down to the back of the camera. Uh, some apps for remote access, Windows Remote Desktop or Windows RDP lets me connect to my computer even if there's no internet. I just need to have a local area network set up through an access point, um, like like a, a little uh, either um, like a little ethernet splitter box or I have just like a regular Wi-Fi router out there. The computer you're connecting to needs to have Windows Pro to use Windows RDP, but the computer you're connecting from does not need to have Windows Pro. It can, it can even, you can even use other platforms to connect um, to using Windows RDP, um, but I haven't, I haven't tried it. I've tried it from my phone. It hasn't worked as well. Um, Chrome Remote Desktop works with any OS, and I can do it from my phone, and that's really nice. No Machine is another one. If you're anti-Google, um, No Machine is, a, is its own separate uh, thing, and it's also multi-platform. And AnyDesk is also another option, although it's a free for personal use type thing, like TeamViewer. So if you if if they perceive that you're using it too often for personal use, you might get shut out of it. Um, so uh, no machine or Chrome remote desktop comes in really handy for that. Um, so the program I use now for all my sequencing is Nina, which is for nighttime imaging and astronomy. It's a free, open source, and actively developed program and is hugely capable, especially after the June 2022 uh, uh, update and the release of Nina 2.0 which has the advanced sequencer. And the advanced sequencer is incredible. I'm absolutely in love with it. And I learned it much quicker than I learned Sequence Generator Pro. They have a support channel on Discord, so you can communicate with the community and the developers directly. Um, it is only for Windows, but honestly, who wants to leave their Mac outside anyway? <laughs> so if you're a Mac user, get a little Windows Nook or a Windows laptop to run your telescope gear, and then you can remote into it from your Mac from inside. It has full equipment control, can run all your stuff, everything from cameras, mounts, and filter wheels. It can run your dome if you have a rotating dome. I, and I think opening and closing a roof is included in that. It communicates with safety monitoring uh, uh, switches, like ones that are connected to cloud and rain monitors and things like that. It'll even, it'll do flip flats and, and flat panels. And the advanced sequencer lets you do multiple targets. You can set start and end times based on astronomical dawn and dusk, target altitude, moon altitude, and those auto update every night. So I don't have to go through and adjust all the times anymore like I had to do in Sequence Generator Pro. Uh, the order of operations is completely configurable. In, in Sequence Generator Pro, I was kind of stuck to its built-in order of operations, which is like, uh, like autofocus, slew to target, and start imaging, which doesn't always work because I'm not always pointed at something when the autofocus runs. In Nina, I can have it slew, slew to approximately the target, then autofocus, and then do a, a plate solve to get on the target now that I'm in focus, and then continue on the sequence from there. And you can set the order of operations to be exactly what you want and what you need for your gear, which is great. And you can have reusable templates. Um, how am I doing on time? <laughs> Dan, come back. Sorry, I'm back. I'm back. Sorry. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're a little over. Um, let's okay. see. It's a, how much do you have left? Or? Uh, I was going to go through some kind of outline of setting up an Nina sequence, but um, I can just kind of mention a couple of things and then get to the end. Yeah, if, if you could, I got uh, Dr. Sure. Sass uh, right behind you. So. OK. Um, yeah, so uh, it has a framing assistant. You can build mosaics with it, um, a flat wizard, so that you don't have to figure out the exposure for your flats. It figures them out for you. Um, I think I, I'm eventually going to produce a video on how to do um, this sequencing in detail. Um, 
I'm just going to have to skip through it for now. But yeah, there's, um, it, it's sort, sort of like, uh, if you're familiar with coding, it's sort of like running in a loop kind of configuration where it runs through the loop, checks for conditions, and runs through. But it's in a way that you're drag, dra dragging and dropping commands in a GUI way. Um, and there's a small learning curve, I think, but I picked it up really quick. And I think other people can learn to pick it up pretty quick as well. Um, yeah, and tons of configurable options. Um, let's see. Uh, you, you can also call external scripts and uh, stuff like that. There's some external plugins you can get for it. A uh, couple quick gen general tips and tricks. When in doubt, reboot. Sometimes it's a power issue or a USB cable issue. Uh, USB is the devil. And just persist. <laughs> it's, it's, this is a, a difficult hobby. and just keep pressing and you'll eventually get stuff figured out. And uh, you can talk to other people in the community to figure out some of these weird problems. It takes a lot of work, but being able to sleep is totally worth it. And that's all I got. <laughs> it does mean I totally agree with that. <laughs> being able to sleep is totally <laughs> worth it. <laughs> that's, that's awesome, Al. That's a great, great, it's a, the progress that you made. Um, and the, the way, I never thought about like numbering my nights of like being that kind of like journalish kind of and i wish i did that and i i would tell everybody to do that moving forward because then you can see your progress and yeah it's really cool when you go back to like day 12 when you're at day like 700 and you're like you know holy cow i remember that when i took that first image of the Andromeda Galaxy, and wasn't that a horrible image, but it was great. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm really, I started it from night one, and I'm really glad I did. I used to do more descriptive, um, kind of writing things up at the end of the night. I got too busy, so now I just take notes, and I, I take notes on, like, um, yeah, the guiding was bad at this target tonight, and then if there's kind of a, I can start to see patterns and then see, like, okay, maybe there's, a, a like, a burr, from something wrong with the gear or something there or um kind of diagnose issues that way but also just to kind of keep a record of what i've done and what i used to do and because I, I i forget like oh i had that set up back at that time or i used to run it that way i totally forgot so yeah, yeah. Totally worth it. That was, uh, that, that, it's, it's really a cool idea um i used to do it with sky tools and, and used to do a, an observational logger and uh and uh i've gotten away from that and i think that after seeing what you're doing with yours i think i'm going to kind of get back into it because even though i'm starting a day i don't know i mean i, I started doing imaging way 20 years ago uh with film and uh i guess i'm starting at day one again so <laughs> so hey, it's it's never too late to start keeping notes uh because you know at some point you'll be five years down the road and have five years of notes Absolutely. and uh Highly encourage visual observers already kind of have this ingrained into them to write this stuff down, um, but I think ash photographers really benefit from that too. Yeah, awesome, Molly, Molly. Thank you so much for coming on. I don't mean to to to, to push you off. I'm not trying to do that. I wish I could have you on all night, uh, but uh, I got Doctor right. Sass waiting on on the back end. Yep. But um, Molly. Awesome presentation. Thank you so much thank for you. coming on and hanging out with us for today. Yes, thank you so much. Really we are we are now four we're halfway through we're only halfway through the show, everybody. <laughs> 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 we just hit the halfway mark, I think. So uh is it it's six o'clock. Yeah, it's almost it's dinner time. So much so more I, space to go. <laughs> it's just so big. It's it's so big. You may think it's a long way to the chemist, but that's nothing compared to space. <laughs> so that's a, another uh, hitchhiker's quote, if we ever get that. But uh, oh, yeah. anyway, anyway, Molly, thank you so much. Um, we'll we'll yeah, definitely look forward to having you on again uh, come in 2020, what year? Three? 23? Yeah, 23. Yeah, three. Yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll definitely hook you up for another another hangout night and look at some more updated progress on your, your journey through the And hopefully you'll have your PhD by then. Yep, I should be graduating next September, so well, fingers crossed. <laughs> we can kind of link that up, and we'll have a little uh, congratulations cake or something. So uh, That'd be fun. There you that'd go. Be great. 
<laughs> awesome, Molly. Thank you so much. You have a good night. Thank you. And thank yeah, you, you again. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.